Greetings, Rob Chastner here, continuing in our study of the, um, the book of Philippians. So if you're following along, you'd want to open up to Philippians chapter 1, and we're going to begin in verse 9 today. Uh, you remember from the previous lesson, Philippi was a first century city in the country called Macedonia, <clears throat> which would be uh, modern day northern Greece. And so some uh, of this becomes the, uh, this church becomes the first European church. It was a great church, a loving church, and a very giving church, and likely one of the most mature churches coming out of the first century. And we uh, discussed in the last uh, uh, lesson that uh, the maturity of this church came due to the, um, uh, the mature leadership, and we found uh, that was including uh, Luke uh, for the first eight years of this church. Um, the context of this letter, it has been about 10 years since Paul planted this church in Philippi. Uh, and during those 10 years, the church has been contributing financially to Paul's ministry. Uh, and now Paul is writing uh, to this very generous church and thanking them for their generous support. There's no tension uh, between the church and the church planter, uh, like we see in some of other uh, letters from Paul. This is a letter of thanks for support <clears throat> uh, that the church had been given, had, had was giving to Paul. Now, there's always a problem with a person or a church who is generous to someone, and that problem can be that the recipient of your generosity could take advantage of your generosity. You could be used uh, because God has opened your heart and there is a willingness and a desire to give. And then there are people out there who would uh, uh, want to take advantage of that goodness or that desire to give. And so followers of Jesus Christ might find themselves being approached by non-believers who uh, do not have integrity and will take advantage of your open-hearted giving. Now, you remind, uh, remember that uh, in our previous lesson, uh, Paul told this church that every time I pray, I pray for you. Imagine that. Now we're going uh, to, to, to be given some insight as to what it is that Paul was praying. We're going to start with verse 9, which says, And this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment. Now, again, this is a very loving and giving church. Paul was praying that it would continue. He is praying that the love and giving would abound. And that word abound is a present tense word from the, from the Greek. Um, uh, in other words, continue to be nice, continue to be giving, continue to be loving, continue to be kind. But notice now the stipulation of giving you have uh, to remember that as followers of Christ, that being kind, generous, loving is not an option. It's a command. And so we're commanded to be kind and generous and loving and giving. And you remember that John tells us in 1 John chapter 4, verse 21, he says, And this commandment we have from him, him being God, that he who loves God must love his brother also. Now, what is love? We tend to think of love as an emotion, uh, but a biblical definition of love is a caring, self-sacrificing commitment <clears throat> that seeks the highest good for the one that we're loving. In other words, there are people who will be crossing your path uh, that you will uh, that will be using you to bring the highest good in that person's life. Now, how can God use me? in their life to bring the highest good in their life? Well, notice that this love is to be based upon two things. First, it must be based upon knowledge. Uh, if you're going to be effective uh, or effectively used to bring the about God's highest good in someone's life, it's going to require that you have some depth or degree of knowledge of this person. And you will find in most churches, uh, you know, there's a special office where people go to and make their financial requests. And sometimes people think that their problem is, <clears throat> is money, 
Um, you know, if they just had more money, they wouldn't have these problems, but they don't realize that there are other issues in our lives, which has led them to money problems. And so, um, uh, you have to have some knowledge of what their circumstances are in order to know whether or not you are to help them. Notice Paul says their love is also based upon discernment. And so, it, you know, if you have some guy asking you for money and you give him money and he ends up buying drugs uh, and getting into trouble, you know, how in the world is are you letting God use you to help bring the highest good out of that person? Sometimes, you know, uh, saying no can be the loving thing to uh, to do when someone asks you for something. So you need knowledge and discernment. So what Paul is saying to this church uh, that that has to be. Uh, a rationale, uh, there has to be a rationale behind your love, your generosity, and your kindness. Our love is not to be uninformed or stupid. Uh, we must remember that we cannot fix everything. None of us have enough money or time or energy to fix all of the world's problems. No one of us can solve the entire poverty problem in the world. In fact, Jesus tells us in Mark chapter 14, verse 7, the poor you will always have with you. So we all have limited time, limited energy, limited money, and we want to take these things and use them to the glory of God. And so we must all base our kindness and generosity on, on knowledge and discernment. This might be a good addition to your prayer life. God, give me knowledge and discernment about those whom you have uh, put in my path that you want me to help. And if our generosity is based upon uh, knowledge and discernment, then there are three things that are going to happen. Um, verse 10 and 11 say that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. So the three things that will happen if you use knowledge and discernment with your love, your kindness, and your generosity. Number one, so that you can approve to recognize as genuine after examining. Uh, now that word approve uh, was used uh, in the testing of metal, not necessarily discerning, be discerning between good and evil, but rather discerning which is good and which is best. Uh, looking at a sample of gold and saying how pure is that gold. Much of the challenge in our life is figuring out what we should be focusing on because uh, there are a lot of secondary issues. Um, so um, uh, uh, being said this way, the whole, the whole art of life I sometimes think is the art of knowing what to leave out or what to ignore. Um, um, how prone are we to waste our energies and time by forgetting what is vital and giving ourselves to second and third rate issues? So we have to understand that we cannot fix everything. We cannot be used by God to solve all the world's problems and issues. But God wants to use me and he wants to use you in some way. So how then or what then should I be using myself? What activity should I be involved with? And so what Paul is saying here, uh, if we take this seriously, how we demonstrate our generosity and our kindness, we are making sure that we make knowledgeable choices we are making sure that we are using discernment, uh, which God has given to us. We will make sh make the right choices. The second thing he says, if we use knowledge uh, and discernment, is you will you will be found sincere and without offense. That word sincere, we have had this word sincere in many of Paul's writings. It means uh, sun tested or judged by sunlight. And uh, back in the first century, <clears throat> you would have uh, uh, statue dealers uh, 
Um, and what would happen is there would be unscrupulous uh, statue dealers. And so um, they would put their statues on display. And let's say they had a broken piece on it. Let's say a pe uh, uh, the ear broke off. What they would do is they grind up the kind of stone that the statue was made out of. They grind it up into powder and uh, they would mix it uh, with wax. And, uh, and then they would make a new ear uh, for that, uh, that statue. And then they would sell it as if it was uh, first good, so to speak. And so when the buyer would take it home and put it in their courtyard and the sun would shine upon it, the wax would melt and the ear would fall off. And so uh, they, they, it created a colloquialism or a term back in this first century era uh, that, that our statues are sun-tested, sun-tested, something like that. And so uh, uh, it would reveal that, uh, that you're selling them the real deal, not something that's been repaired. And then we have, uh, and then when we're seen as the real deal, notice the third thing he says is to the glory and praise of God, the way that God is worshiped through our kindness and our generosity is when our kindness and generosity is based upon knowledge and discernment. And this is why Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 16, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. And so we must manage our kindness and generosity through knowledge and discernment so that God can be glorified. All right, so verse 12 says, But I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. Now, this letter is being written by Paul while he's in the prison. And while he's in prison, it's no fault of his own that he's there. Uh, he's in there because of the corrupt uh, government leaders. And he ends up in this prison for about three years. Now, you can imagine if you found yourself in prison for three years that you would probably have... Uh, a little bit of animosity or bitterness or anger built up, but there's none of there's not even a hint of that in Paul's writings here. There's no hint of bitterness or anger. What Paul is saying is notice this word furtherance. It has the meaning of driving forward as if by beating. Uh, this was a term that was used on the Roman battlefield when all of the soldiers would lock their shields together and they'd march step by step. And every step that they took, they were taking over more ground to the glory of Rome. And what Paul is realizing here is that while God has me here in this prison, God is using me to take more territory for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's a, a, a like, there, there's likely a couple of things going on here in the Philippians uh, church. First, there were some people, you know, who were second guessing God. And this happens from time to time with believers when things happen that are out of our control uh, or something bad happens in our life. But when we are keeping our noses clean and we're doing all of the right things and then something bad results, human nature starts second guessing God. And we find ourselves thinking, well, if I were God, this is what I would do. You know, did it make any sense to the Philippian church? That, they, that God would take the greatest evangelist of all time, the greatest church planter, the greatest missionary in all of history. We're talking about Paul. And does it make sense to take him off the mission field and put him, uh, put him into um, uh, prison, behind prison bars? Paul was turning the Roman Empire upside down, and now God has taken him off the mission field and putting him in prison. It just didn't make sense to the church of Philippi. Uh, Philippi. But Paul is saying to them, I want you to understand that the kingdom, the gospel is going forward, even in this situation that I find myself in, uh, inside this prison. Also, there were likely, there was a level of embarrassment uh, by the church in Philippi. You know, remember in the introduction, we talked about uh, the church, uh, the city of Philippi was a very patriotic city. There was a lot of military there, both retired and active duty. And imagine that you were, you know, in the Philippian church and you were sharing about the church to some retired military citizen in, in Philippi. Uh, and, and he asked, well, how did your church get started? And you start talking, well, there's this guy, Paul, and he was the great, a great evangelist. And uh, you got to meet him someday. And he was in Troas and he had a vision and he came over here to Philippi and 
the rest is history. And then the guy does a follow up question. Well, where is he now? And then, you know, you have this embarrassing answer. Well, he's in prison. So the message that Paul is giving is that the Philippian church is, um, you know, you need not you need not be embarrassed about the situation that I'm in where I'm in prison. Paul is saying God is at work and God is furthering his interest. And now how is God furthering his interest? Let's look at verse 13 so that it has become evident that the whole palace guard uh, and to all the rest that my chains are in Christ. So you might want to underscore, if you're someone who likes to highlight or underscore scripture, uh, that's important. I mean, it's all important, but this is really special. I would underline or highlight, uh, my chains are in Christ. Um, these prison guards, you know, were, which were likely cynical people, you know, everyone tells a prison guard, I'm innocent, you know, uh, uh, I didn't do this, but I'm not supposed to be here. You know, and so prison guards get cynical. Notice that all the prison guards, the whole palace guard, knows why Paul is there. Not because he's an enemy of the state, but rather because Paul is living uh, for the cause of Jesus Christ. Now, notice the word palace guard. Uh, it, uh, in the original language, it was praetorian. Uh, P-R-A-E-T-O-R-I-U-M, Praetorium. It has the meaning of the tent uh, of the commander-in-chief. It meant the imperial guards. If you were to study Josephus, the first century historian, some of his writings tell us that this was the purest part of the army. They served for 16 years rather than 25. Uh, they protected the emperor and his family. They received triple pay and a very generous retirement. And no doubt many of these retired military in Philippi were the Praetorian guards. You remember, uh, if you ever studied Luke, Luke, uh, the book of Acts ends uh, in chapter 28, 16. It says, now when he came to Rome, the centurion delivered the prisoners to the captain of the guard, but Paul was permitted to dwell by himself with the soldier who guarded him. That term captain of the guard, that meant the pr uh, prefect of the Praetorium. Uh, we know who this guy is. His name was Burrus, and uh, he was the prefect of the Praetorium, uh, whose official duty was to keep the cust uh, keep in custody all accused persons who were to be tried before the emperor. Burrus was the second in command of Rome, and he was the only guy for a time that had control over Caesar Nero. Obviously, history shows that Caesar Nero poisoned and killed this guy, Burrus. But Burris did not put Paul in prison. He gave Paul his own private little apartment and allowed visitors to come and go freely. These prison guards were being impacted by the evangelism of Paul, even while he was in prison. And you can understand in retrospect why God took so much, such a valuable asset in Paul off of the mission field and put him into a political prison because the Lord wanted to see the gospel reach all the way to the halls of power in Rome. God knows what he's doing. There are going to be times in your life and in my life that just don't make any sense, where you find yourself in some kind of circumstance you need to remind yourself, God is in control, God is sovereign over all things. Then ask yourself, who is crossing my path in this situation that I would not have otherwise had any contact? You know, maybe it's a medical professional a tow truck driver, a police officer, an auto mechanic, maybe a county prosecutor. That is the, uh, you know, but in that situation, you're going to bump into someone who you normally would not cross paths with. And so here we see Paul is developing relationship with kingmakers, uh, the unseen hand of government. Uh, these are leaders in the, in the military. And they, are, uh, they were the ones who were controlling the reins of power in Rome. And now Paul is saying, because of what God has done with me, uh, putting me in prison, God is making headway even in the halls of power of the Roman Empire. God was also doing something else. Notice now in verse 14. And most of the brethren in the Lord, having become confident by my chains, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Now, not only was Paul's prison time and his evangelism there affecting unbelievers and impacting their lives. 
it was also impacting believers' lives. There had, um, <clears throat> uh, has this not been, uh, you know, your own experience? You know, you have a friend who's a Christian. They're going through a very dark hour of their life, you know, and yet they're retaining their faith, their courage. And you watch this uh, event unfold and you begin to think, well, what in the world am I whining about this? You know, why, why am I so weak? I mean, what's wrong with me and why am I crying about my own circumstances? Look at this person over there uh, who's going through a much more horrible issue uh, or circumstance and they're keeping their faith in Jesus Christ. When you see other people who perhaps have a loss of a child or a devastating diagnosis or some kind of a life-threatening accident and you watch them stay faithful to Jesus Christ, what an impact can that have on your own life while you're watching them? And that was what was going on here with Paul. There were believers in Rome. They were witnessing Paul standing strong in his faith, even though he was in, in, uh, in prison. And the result was that the courage of those people was infused uh, by Paul's courage. And... <clears throat> um, uh, and they became better evangelists for us. Now, it didn't happen to the entire church. Notice this in verses 15 through 17. <coughs> Some indeed preach Christ even from envy and strife, <coughs> and some from goodwill. The former preach Christ from selfish ambition, not sincerely supposing to add affliction to my chains, but the latter out of love, knowing that I am appointed, um, uh, for the defense of the gospel. And so now he takes the church and he puts it into two categories. You've got one, the first category are people in the church who where their hearts are not right. And then you have the second category where their hearts are right. Both camps are preaching Christ. Both camps are promoting Christ. And the one camp that's doing it in such a way that they're trying to undermine uh, Paul and his efforts and his nerves now, what is going on here? The church body at large has the idea that church leaders are as pure as the wind-driven snow. And if you believe that, you're gravely mistaken. Just because somebody is standing on a platform or behind a pulpit does not mean that that party is a pure individual. That doesn't have any, you know, any any issue. Uh, those people have issues. There, you know, some of them you know, pastors, elders, and so forth, everybody has fallen in some way. And it's amazing how many insecure men find their way into ministry, and uh, that insecurity manifests its way uh, in a variety of ways. One of those ways is that they get very territorial. I mean, like, uh, uh, you know, this is my church area, you can't have a church here. And sometimes the insecurity manifests itself with control, or they become control freaks. Uh, you got to think about what just happened to Paul. Paul has not been in Rome for very long. He just gets there and he's already having the Spirit of God moving in incredible ways. And the Spirit of God is moving among the praetorium, the, uh, the guard leaders. And the church is being encouraged by uh, to be more bold with their testimony and their witness on the streets of Rome. Yet there are other evangelists that have been there in Rome for years with accomplishing very little for the kingdom. Paul waltzes in and all kinds of advancements happen quickly because of the witness of Paul. And what Paul is pointing out here in these verses, <clears throat> there are some insecure people in Rome, they're territorial, and they're criticizing Paul for his efforts. And what human nature will do is they'll camouflage criticism with impure doctrine. They begin to spread rumors and, uh, you know, how much of your own criticism on others is rooted in jealousy and insecurity. That's human nature. And so we see this all the time in the Christian community, and that is exactly what was going on here in, the, in Rome. There were people who were preaching Jesus Christ and doing it in such a way that they were trying to bring harm against Paul. Now, how does Paul respond? You know, human nature is that we have, uh, you know, have us rerun in our minds uh, about all these episodes on how we've been wronged by church leaders or churches. Paul teaches us a very important lesson here. He is not sitting in prison recalling the heartache and the pain of, of all of these other church people who are talking against him. 
Look how he responds, verse 18. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and in this I rejoice. Yes, and will rejoice. Isn't it interesting? Here we have many church leaders who were preaching Christ in such a way that they were causing pain to Paul. And as Paul was sitting in his prison cell, he doesn't focus on what was wrong, but rather he focuses on what is right. And if you make a lifestyle choice of focusing on everything in your past that has gone wrong, this is going to be a path that will wear you out. And if you spend all of your time following the news and the agenda of our culture, which is fueled by the devil, you're going to, uh, to have a miserable existence. But rather, if you focus on your life on what is right, as Paul is demonstrating here in these verses, Paul is saying Christ is being preached I don't know what their motivation is. I don't know why they're speaking against me. It doesn't really matter. What matters is that Christ is being preached and that is what I'm focusing on and that is what I'm rejoicing in. So to close on this study, there are three thoughts. Redeemed people, even those used by God, are never completely free of jealousy and impure motivation. We must realize every individual in the church, to one degree or another, is defective. Every leader, every pastor, every teacher is a defective human being. So stop expecting perfection from anyone else in the church other than Jesus Christ. The second thought is you cannot allow your joy to be dependent on others being perfect. If you're going to wait to be joyful, as soon as the church absolutely becomes perfect, I'm thinking you don't have a lot of joy in your future. How easy is it for that we understand that we are not perfect, yet uh, we expect perfection from everyone around us in the church? You know, I am going to be in a bad mood until you decide that you're going to be a perfect individual. Well, what do we rejoice in? What is that, you know, what is our joy rooted in? Is it rooted in, in circumstances, or is it rooted in the finished work of Jesus Christ? You can't root your joy uh, on the way your fellow Christians are, are, are behaving. Uh, the third is God uses everything. Some of the greatest lessons which we have learned are lessons that we have learned through seasons of pain. Look back through your life on the bad experiences that you have had in your current church and your past churches and uh, we uh, you know you've been used you've been duped you've been uh, things have gone wrong yet these experience will teach you a lesson they'll teach you something aren't you smarter now than you were during those bad situations God taught you something uh, in those bad experiences God brought you some maturity so God is teaching and maturing his people and he is going to take us through various seasons of life. And what we have to focus on is Jesus Christ. If you are going to start focusing on everything that is wrong and every bad thing that has happened to you, you're going to go to your grave and very bitter person. The Lord wants us to come to the end of our lives rejoicing and being filled with great joy that Christ is finishing the work that he has begun in our lives. And so you're going to focus, you know, are you going to focus on the work of God or are you going to focus on uh, other people who have hurt you? Paul teaches us that we are to focus uh, uh, on the great joy of the finished work of Jesus Christ. Amen. I hope this has been helpful and informative. Our next study will be uh, Philippians chapter 1 verses 19 through 30 and uh, thank you for viewing and uh, good day.